Hello, thank you for uh, letting me uh, interrupt your uh, dinners tonight. This, um, this happens to be the latest uh, Live and Levi's commercial. It's been a, a banner for us over the last about three to four years. And um, this is hot off the press. And actually, all the performers you see in the, uh, the advertisement came from the Live and Levi's project, music project, where we basically uh, take talent like Skepta, Rosario in, uh, in Spain, and we partner them and create an environment where we can take underprivileged youth with a lot of talent and basically have them learn from the superstars. And it's been a, a successful program now. We've rolled it out to several countries. We actually, FC St. Pauli actually has a recording studio in their stadium um, that we actually use with German artists and um, for, for uh, giving lessons to students. We've got thousands and thousands of hours now, but that's, um, that's who we've used in the, uh, the latest commercial. Um, so story tonight, I hope it's relevant. Uh, I think there were, I sat through a couple of presentations today, and I think there's some commonality. Some of this may be appropriate to your business. Some of it may not, but it's our, uh, it's our story. Um, I've been with Levi's now, um, going on year number seven. Uh, I was one of uh, CEO Chip Berg's sort of initial enterprise uh, hires when he put together the, the, new, uh, the new team. Just to give you some context, um, I've been in my careers going on 40 years now. Um, three brands have sort of dominated that timetable. I started in the action sports world with this little brand called Quicksilver uh, when they were a little $10 million company. And we were trying to figure out how to become a global company. And we just did it all by breaking all the rules and almost by accident. I was there from the 10 to $100 million range. Then I joined this little company called Nike. Um, started at the $4 billion mark and was with the company for 12 years. Uh, left at the $13 uh, billion mark. Um, and I was really fortunate. It, it was at a time when uh, Nike was starting to really put its foot on the gas in apparel and also internationally. And that created some, uh, some amazing experiences for me. And then the third, obviously, is Levi joining uh, seven years ago. Whereas, you know, Nike had a ton of momentum and were expanding into new businesses. Levi's, on the other hand, has been a, a major uh, turnaround project. Um, so story is... Really, you know, our CEO coined the phrase 165-year-old at the time was a 150-year-old startup. And what would that feel like? And now today, it's, it's the next chapter in what we're doing with the new, uh, new world order. So the story starts, you know, 165 years ago with a uh, German immigrant, immigrant from Buttenheim, Germany. He uh, comes over with his family to New York and then decides to, to go out to the Wild West and start a dry goods uh, business at the, uh, the ripe old age of 18. Um, and really right from the beginning um, had this, these insights into his, uh, his customer. And along came a gentleman by the name of Jacob Davis who had this incredible idea for putting rivets on the, uh, the denim uh, over what they were called overalls at the time, but put the uh, rivets on the denim to strengthen the joints, creating really the most functional, strongest uh, pant possible. Uh, and that was the birth of the uh, blue jean. It was strictly from a functional standpoint with the uh, miners. And then that started to expand from there where the uh, cowboys looked at the functionality of the jeans, you know, something they could wear 24-7 on the range. And again, you know, having this incredibly durable functional product. And then from there, uh, Levi started looking at the, uh, the ranches and realizing 50% of the population didn't wear their jeans and there was an opportunity. These women want, obviously wanted something as appropriate to the ranch, but they also wanted style. And that was something, the combination of, of style and, and um, denim bottom, something that we cherish um, and really drives our engine uh, today. Um, from there, Dockers was launched in the 1970s based on the, uh, you know, Levi's made great pants and the idea that things were moving to a more casual Friday environment and uh, it quickly became a, a billion dollar brand. In the 1980s, um, Levi's launched its first direct-to-consumer stores, uh, primarily in the U.S., and then started to expand internationally in that time period as well. Um, and then Hollywood quickly adopted the uh, denim jean as sort of the symbol of that youth rebelliousness and, um, and you know, serious re rebellion attitude um, by men and women, and then music. And today it's an, also an important part of our DNA as so many uh, bands over the years have, have adopted jeans as style. 
And then we started to show up in moments that matter. And if you look at Woodstock or you look at the, uh, the Berlin Wall, you know, at one point, Levi's was actually currency. You could travel into Eastern Europe with a, um, with a suitcase full of jeans and pay for your trip. And I don't think there are many products or brands that have that kind of, uh, of cult status. So everything was going right until everything went wrong. The brand was getting crushed from all sides by, you know, different competitors that were getting into the denim business, some on the premium side, some beating Levi's at cost. Levi's was starting to create marketing campaigns that really were, seemed like they were more about winning awards than actually connecting with consumers. And then it was a, a series of hires at executive level. All the uh, CEOs coming in had varying... Um, turnaround strategies that they tried to impose on the organization. The pipe started to get disaligned. A lot of failed, failed uh, strategies that, again, you know, depending on who was sitting on the, uh, the perch, it seemed like it was a new strategy every day. And the company almost went broke. You know, 10 years ago, it had about $1.8 billion in, uh, in debt and was very, very near liquidation, which, you know, looking at where it is today, you can't imagine the brand was that close to, to going bust. You know, we spend uh, time with Jim Collins, the author. I'm a, just a massive fan of his. And when we first sat down with him about uh, seven years ago, he basically took us through the five stages of, uh, you know, how the mighty fail. And we were there. We were actually at st stage five. You know, this was a company that every one of those um, attributes along a failed path, we had, uh, we had done them all and, and uh, we we were at that last place, so we only had a couple of choices, one turn it around or, or two fail. So the story really starts with, you know, how did a brand that was so close to going into liquidation actually, you know, earn this headline from The Guardian only a year ago when uh, the brand was showing up on, um, on a lot of uh, youth again. So started, I'll never forget. I really, when I first got the, uh, the call um, about an opportunity at Levi's, I said, Thank you, but no thank you. And uh, an ex-colleague of mine from Nike actually convinced me I'll be forever grateful. She said, you've got to meet the new CEO. Just come up and spend a little time with him. And, and like I said, I'll be forever grateful. And I'll never forget him telling me that he was ready to take a sledgehammer, do whatever it took to restore the brand. And also what I needed most in my career was to, uh, to have this, um, be part of this noble cause, um, to turn around one of the great, greatest brands of all time. So when I first got to Europe, and you'll see a lot of the context here is from Europe because, you know, a couple of things. One, that's what I've been, been running for the last few years. But also, we've driven really two-thirds of the top and bottom line growth during that period. In fact, many of the strategies that have been adopted by the company were really incubated in, uh, in Europe. So I kept hearing this. People didn't hate the brand but they didn't love the brand. And it's sort of as if the brand completely went to sleep and skipped a generation. So the first thing was getting the brand awake again because we were still the largest <laughs> denim supplier in the entire European marketplace, but we had just sort of fallen asleep at the wheel and people were feeding off our carcass. So again, going back to Jim Collins, I'm just a huge believer that you got to get the right, before you ever put strategy on paper, you've got to get the right people in the right seats. And we had the right people in the wrong seats, we had a few people in the right seats, and we had a lot of wrong people in, in the wrong seats. And so it really was the first part of our rebuild was all starting with talent and, and getting people aligned and, and on the, the same page. We started into reconstruction, looking at firefighting and quick wins. We were actually fortunate we were only shipping about 60% of our order files. So that was obviously a quick win, just lining up the pipes and starting to, to satisfy commuter, um, consumer demand. We were playing defense. We were actually following what everybody else did and trying to react to it. So once we stood up and sort of threw off the chains and started to play our own game, it meant others had to, had to follow our lead. We put consumers right back at the center of everything we did. We had too many people sitting around in rooms trying to engineer the process. And if you asked them, and I did, you know, what are you working on? How does this benefit your customers or consumers? I got a lot of blank stares because it was more about improving the process than what was happening out here with the, uh, the consumer. Um, we went back to, to denim as our reason to be as our starting gate. And the marketplace had been used as sort of a, um, 
an excuse for underperformance. And we finally got the team wrapped around the idea that that's the new norm. And it's not going to be an excuse. It's actually going to be a, a way for us to distance ourselves from our competitors. And then we started really looking at the idea that we were underspent on marketing. We had put too much money in our back-end processes. We started a huge reorganization of the company. I think our competitors at the time were looking at this move and feeling like they're really in trouble. They're on their deathbed. When actually it was a deliberate process to create more marketing fuel. And what was interesting about this time period was that not only were we underspent and were, you know, needed to push more fuel into marketing, but we needed to negotiate better and we start, needed to start to use analytics so that our mix was more productive. Once we did that, it really took our marketing and amplified it widely in terms of how much we had. And again, as the denim leader in Europe, we had more money to spend once we simply stepped up and, and started to spend it in the right way. And along came the Live and Levi's campaign, sort of our just do it moment. This came from a, an insight with a consumer in India and she was showing our, her, our CEO her closet and she pulled out a drawer of all her denim. And she had different brands in there, you know, that she wore on a day-to-day -day basis. But she had one pair that she pulled out. And he said, what are those? And she goes, I can't wear these anymore. But I wore these jeans in college. And, I, and even though they don't fit, I can't give them away because of what they represented. And that's where she said, you own other jeans, but you live in Levi's. And that was where that, the insight there was where the campaign was born that we're still running today. One of the other key insights into our company was we've always been be best when we're at our, the center of culture. And I'll show you in a few minutes what that feels like today, but that was an important part of us challenging ourselves, why aren't we relevant anymore and what's it going to take for us to become relevant again? So from there, from the firefighting, we quickly pivoted to strategy. And it was interesting because what others had seen as a weakness being in the middle was actually a strength because all we had to do was be cooler than the brands at the top and understand pricing elasticity to be the first brand of choice from the bottom. And then from there as we just simply got, took our giant position with very little competition and moved to share of closet head to toe and then to share of wallet, which is an experience and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But ultimately, it put us in an incredibly strong position. And with consistency, with innovation, great execution, all of a sudden, the, the story started to change. We quickly, as a leadership team, put our ambition on $2 billion, And we said that you know, our North Star was going to be $2 billion, always at the crossroads and center of culture. We had fans who'd left us. We had fans who were still with us, but it was an aging population. And then we had an entire generation of fans who hadn't even tapped into us. So we started to build bridges to these fans, whether they were sport fans, whether they were young fans, whether they were women, you know, half the population that we, we hadn't been uh, focused on in a very long time. All those segments looked at assortments, looked at marketing, looked at the distribution and started to line up those bridges so we were speaking to people on a much more connected level. Three areas we really focused on that have become parts of the corporate strategy, women's, in fact, some of our countries today in Europe are over 50% uh, women's versus men's in the mix. Tops, you know, we had been a men's bottoms company, but you know, anybody in apparel knows that consumers typically, or brands that are head to toe typically sell four to one tops to bottoms. And we were very underpenetrated in tops. And then direct to consumer, taking our story directly to, uh, to the public. You know, unfiltered, how does that feel like? And, and having come from Nike, that was a big unlock where every, every place you put a Nike town, it floated all the boats in the bay. And so we started to make a real conscious move there. We looked at the world of digi digital and physical and how we could blend the two together so that people could basically learn about the brand online and pick up in store. And we've started now down the track of going the, uh, the other way as well. So starting beyond denim, head to toe, men and women all ages across Europe always on. And the lights all started to go green. In fact, we were growing in every country, both gender, across all categories. Um, you know, things really started to click. And typical of brands when they get hot, the uh, hockey star stick started with a very deliberate um, 
uh, strategy as we move through the, uh, the years. Um, very proud of the fact in 2018, we were the second fastest growing uh, apparel brand and right behind Gucci and with the, the rest of that group wasn't a bad place to play. Um, champagne came off and we went public again, you know, based on the, uh, the company, strong company results. Again, seven or eight years before near bankruptcy. And, and if you look at the equivalent here, when we went public, Eight years ago, the stock was at $30. Even though we were a private company, we had public debt, and so we had a stock price. $30, and essentially the equivalent was we came out at, at uh, 222 So not a, bad little, uh, not a little bad little run over that uh, time frame. But the question is, okay, we sort of the noble cause, we sort of completed it. So what's next? So we've, we've affectionately coined the phrase, the, uh, the new starting line. You know, brands are really at a crossroads today. I don't think this surprises anybody. But we've been a brand that's really had our foot on the gas, and the road is starting to get very murky ahead. And then, as we all know, you start driving really fast on a windy road, and you can't see what's up ahead. Not a great recipe for, um, for success. Um, when you've got headlines like this, yellow vests, you know, and this happens to be, you know, Spanish independence, but on the other side, this could be a climate march. It could be around wages. You know, when consumers are out here using their voice, they're obviously not in the stores buying, uh, buying Levi's product. Um, you know, leading economic indicators, again, not, uh, not painting a rosy picture, and sometimes our, uh, our high streets are looking like um, ghost towns to some degree as, uh, as traffic titans, which leads to a change in strategy. Consumers, again, moving more online to mobile, and the attention spans. I remember not so long ago telling people we had three seconds of uh, attention for a consumer, and that's been shortened uh, dramatically. So all those things have to play again into what's our, uh, what's our next step. Consumer, earlier the panel was talking about convenience. You know, this for us is frictionless operations. The consumer expectations have changed dramatically in what's table stakes now in terms of, uh, of service and what's best in class. So brands have tough choices ahead. Do you focus on the immediate or do you focus on the future um, trying to stay ahead of, of um, technology and consumer changes? We love talking about now, and it's a big cultural shift, getting everybody used to the idea what got us to the podium and successful won't get us there in the, uh, in the future. As you know, data and analytics, agility, and uh, innovation all become more important parts of the, uh, the equation um, as we move forward. Um, so brands have to redefine themselves. You know, and, and we're hopefully feel like we're on that, that path or this successful path of being a great brand another 150 years ago. We have to redefine our economic flywheels. You know, what are those clicks that you're driving again to, to steal from Jim Collins? But how are you creating flywheels that are going to be relevant for the next uh, 10 years? And what are going to be your competitive advantage, your points of, uh, of difference? So we have six things we're focused on right now. Um, that hopefully will set us up for the, um, the new world order. The first is experience. And I know people talk about consumer experience, but for us, there are four pillars, and all of them are equally important because the more you can blend them together, the more you can amplify experience. So whether it's consumer and customer or your partners or employees, again, you should never look at it, or we don't look at it from a standpoint of looking at one silo without saying, can we pull the others in to really amplify the experience? Experience has a lot of facets, but really what's going to matter is your recipe of what you're going to be creating for the, uh, for the consumer. Ours starts with customization and personalization. This is also something that's become really important to us around our testing muscle. Because, you know, if you're going to really succeed in the new world order, you're going to have to be able to uh, test, um, test and, and scale, test and fail, and fail fast and fail cheap. And as Nick was talking about legacy culture, really a tough thing when your company has been focused on the big projects with the big consultants and the big wins and not used to this environment where you're running, you know, we run now anywhere from, you know, 70 to 80 tests at one time in projects around the company. You have to organize differently around task forces. You have to, you have to trust. You have to trust deeper in your organization than ever before. And your employees have to trust you at the same time too. So it really does change the equation. 
Our print bars happened as, a, again, a small little test in a few stores, and we scaled it. We have our, our Lot 1 Couture, which is made to measure uh, uh, denim. And then on a larger scale, um, I don't know if you've read, but we started, um, we, actually, we started this project about three years ago where we started to um, build lasers into the, um, into the, you know, we actually pulled all our partners together, our best partners, and asked them if they were ready to go on the next adventure with us, millions of dollars of investment to bring lasers into the production process. And this basically um, took water, you know, really limited the amount of water use, you know, taking it down 80, 90 percent. It created a much cleaner process for, uh, for the workers, and then on top of it allowed us to be much more agile. But this was a, a part, of, um, part of the New World Order. Um, CRM, an important part of it, less transactional, more experiential. And then we, have, we affectionately call this the RAT, and it's basically integrated marketing, but on a bigger scale. Why the rat? Because of ratatouille. If you look at companies like Disney and the big production houses, they hit the market so hard and fast with a new film, new products, cross-distribution channels, and it has to happen on a day. And so we've told ourselves, you know, we need to be able to develop this muscle around the rat, and now we're fattening the rat, actually, um, as we build in consumer insights, analytics, um, and personalization, um, and really leverage technology. We, you know, we have four launches going right now. We launched the Google Jacket with Jacquard, um, which is basically um, technology and apparel. We have a bags launch, women's bags we just launched. We launched um, a kid, new kids range, and we've also launched a bodywear range, all in the last month. All of it with impact across um, the distribution we selected in Europe. So really, really important for us to build this integrated muscle. Embracing migration. You know, talk about experience. Your outlet stores now are actually targeting consumers in their home country before they even get on a plane or a boat to come to Europe. And the good news is we have a territory here where a lot of people want to come to visit. So being able to use your analytics and really getting after um, creating the right experience for, for tourists is important. We like to coin the phrase, we want to be rock and roll on the outside and act like a switch watch on the inside. Our four pillars of the experience are, are values, fashion style, music and sport and direct to consumer with the goal of being always on for consumers. And it came up in the panel today, but it's not those holiday moments. It's not how do you create moments constantly, particularly in limited consumer traffic. And then how do you bundle digital and physical? We're not going to beat Amazon. We're not going to be the best at e-commerce. But we have 6,000 points of distribution. We're actually pairing it back now. We're trying to cut out 1,000 points of distribution because we want to elevate and connect the experience because that will be our competitive advantage. And also, the other thing is we don't want this to be cookie cutter. We want to give the consumer a reason to shop in every one of our stores or have the right assortment for a consumer in the right stores. For us, building retail in the online experience should feel more like siblings from the same parents, where although you can see the connection in the DNA, on the other hand, there's, there's individuality, there's individual personality, and that's how we look at, at retail rather than a, a cookie-cutter approach. We take that digital technology into our showroom experience. And then the second piece to this are relationships. Relationships more important than ever. And they come in multi-facets, whether you're talking about, you know, we were fortunate to uh, partner with Liverpool uh, in the, uh, just at the time of the Champions League win, which wasn't bad uh, timing. Sometimes you're better be lucky than good. Um, Skepta and Rosario I mentioned, also with other brands around if you can create one plus one brand heat, um, one plus one equals ten for the consumer. Massive investment for your factories around laser technology for the future or with um, different groups like the Better Cotton Initiative where it's a consortium around more responsible uh, cotton growth. So, you know, partnership today is very different than what it was before while you were trying to control everything yourself. The third piece is science and how we build data and analytics now into the organization. I completely agree with Nick today when he was talking about the fact it needs to start at the top. Um, 
We're trying not to break it out too much. I think we've had more success when we embed it in the culture. But ultimately, whether it's the consumer, whether it's the assortment productivity, your store productivity, and then ultimately innovation. This happens to be our Eureka Lab in San Francisco, close to the headquarters. Designers can come over here and basically have their own factory to create the, the newest generation of, of denim or tops or Google technology into our garments, whatever it is, now is part of our uh, laboratory. Fourth piece, quality before quantity, and I don't mean quality of our products, I mean quality of our business. There are so many things we need to try and invest in, and we need to take our marketing to a whole another level in terms of, particularly as you get into the digital area, which might be deleveraging um, in terms of your investment, but we have to create more fuel. There's no two ways about it. So you've got to really restrict your obsess DNA and put it into demand creation. Number five, values. And I'm fortunate to work for a company that puts its values front and center. It has since the beginning. People say that values in the new world order will be more important as a brand differentiator, maybe more than product and marketing. So we look at it again, whether it's pride, we took an early stand on the refugee crisis, first giving product, then we started creating jobs with other organizations and partnerships, and then we created employee experiences. We're with Convivial in Belgium. We actually have our employees go down there and donate time. We sponsor a, a refugee football team in the Netherlands. And that's something we contribute to. So, you know, and then you talk about the environment and sustainability with, that came up today. You know, it's under the umbrella for us that we can be very profitable, but through our principles, with our values front and center. We are the most sustainable global apparel brand in history. Go to any vintage stores or vintage areas that are popular, like Camden in, um, outside of London. Try to find a brand that that's more visible than Levi's in there. But for us, that's been a dirty little secret for years. We really didn't want those stores to be purposing our denim because we wanted consumers to buy new denim. In the new world order, we're going to bring these guys under the umbrella. They should be part of the plan. We should be promoting repurposing of denim. That's where partnership changes. When it comes to other areas, carbon, water, chemicals, people, Working conditions for the factories, these are all important areas and all opportunities for us to scream our values to consumers, but they have to be backed up. They've got to be backed up with accountable goals that tell people what you're going to do, and then you've got to deliver on your, on your promises, whether it's carbon or whether it's water. And then as I mentioned, how do you tie those things back to your employee teams? So whether it's Climate Week events, or we actually pay for our employees to go out and march and use your voice. If it's something they're passionate about, we want them out there as part of the movements. And finally, I put this last, but it's sort of where everything starts, and that's with our talent and team. I, you know, there are times when I wish I hadn't read these two books because they really point to sort of the new, the new way of thinking for companies and how you have to shift and how trust is going to be, trust in collapsing your organization is going to be so much more important in the future. To be honest, after reading these, I think the modern businesses are going to feel more like college campuses. I really believe that's the, the greatest analogy where you're going to have your schedule for the week. You're going to go to these classes, but you're going to contribute with your teammates. You might be on four or five task forces, and they may constantly change over time. You'll learn from your classmates. You'll share cross-functionally. And ultimately, it's, not, it's going to be the teacher as facilitator, not as trying to control everything that happens. Your values are going to have to set your controls. And, I, you know, I love this slide. This is a great example here of how things have already changed in the way things are set up organizationally. I mean, obviously, they're using a little less paper over there. But on the other hand, I mean, look at the difference in diversity. Don't see guys standing over the, looking over people's shoulders to make sure they don't make a mistake or need help otherwise. It's done very, very differently, and that's, that's where things are headed. You know, we need more level five leaders as an organization, leaders who are more ambitious, 
but always put the company and the values first? How do we get a flatter matrix organization, best global local balance, customer obsessed, values driven, more speed and, ability, speed and agility, and then having data underpin everything we do with a growth mindset? So we've reset our sites as a leadership team in Europe, doubling basically everything with experience at the center and center of culture. And this is what success feels like. And, you know, it's interesting because when people say retail is dead, I love to pull out this slide. We had people like, this isn't an Apple logo above the store. This was actually a very real event that we've actually duplicated. You know, we did it in, in um, London, Paris, and Berlin now twice, where we had people lined up the night before for products, both at the Nike store and our store for the Jordan launch. We sold out in 90 minutes. So, again, I think you have to give people a reason, something exciting, something exclusive. You have to give them experience. And that's our, uh, that's our story, and I'm sticking to it. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. <laughs>